Hi guys, we've got Nick Taber here today from New England Solar. Now Nick has started in solar very early and let's find out because he's in regional New South Wales and regional solar is very different to city solar and we will find out how and why. Hello, Nick. Welcome to our podcast. Thanks for having me, Marcus. No problem. What was the youngest age that you started to dabble in solar? I think about five. So um, <laughs> my grandfather started the business in 97. I was born in 96. And so it would have been about, yeah, 2001 or so that I was starting to go out and help. And uh, yeah, I got very upset when I had to start going to school because all of a sudden I couldn't go to work anymore. Oh my so, um, <laughs> <laughs> so you've been doing solar literally all all your life. Pretty well, yep. Wow, yeah. wow. So what would a five-year-old do on the site other than be in the way? Um, well, speak for yourself. Um, so, uh, yes, well, my job was to unbox all the solar panels. So back then, panels were, you know, sort of 80 watts or so, and they'd come wrapped up in an individual cardboard box, and they'd all have a manual in them, and uh, I had to unpack them all, cut all the tyres off, and then and then lift them up to the guys on the roof, or I was pretty well just a gopher, you know, so someone needs a screwdriver or needs a something, and rather than get off the roof and get it, they just make me go and get it out of the ute and deliver it to them. And so. what, climb up the ladder? Yeah, and then pass it to them from the top of the ladder. Right, yeah. right. And it, you enjoyed that, did I you? I did. And I got paid $10 a day. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Which at five was amazing. That was a, yeah. was a lot of pocket money. Well, the way Solo's going right now should be about the same income. <laughs> 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 oh my God. So now you're in charge of the company, are you? So yes. you've taken yep. over, have you? Tell us the journey. Yeah. So um, I, uh, you know, sort of grew up into it uh, as I got older, you know, school holidays, straight out of school, straight back into the installs kind of thing. Um, finished school and uh, uh, started my own IT business and ran that for a couple of years. And um, to sort of, I found myself look, thinking and going, yeah, look, there's kind of something here in this IT stuff, but you know, um, I'm just kind of got solar in my blood, and so let's let's get stuck into that. And so, kind of moved back into the business with my grandfather, and then in uh, 2019 bought it from him, and then uh, yeah, run it myself now. So right, yeah. So what services do you provide, and which area do you service? So we're pretty well New England Northwest, so um, sort of north to the Queensland border, um, east kind of the east to the uh, mountain ranges, west to kind of Narrabri and south to kind of Scone. So it's a pretty big area of install. Um, in terms of different things, it's it's mostly on-grid solar, um, which is, you know, very popular, uh, but uh, certainly hybrid systems with batteries, off-grid and a bit of solar pumping as well. Right. So what about EV charging? Has that come into the country yet? It has, but it's fairly slow at the moment. Um, I think, you know, the adoption rate is is pretty slow at the moment, but that's that's okay. Um, certainly do have customers looking into that stuff and investigating that area. Um, and of course, we're supporting them, you know, with 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 uh, EV charges and things like that. Um, it's a tricky one to balance, you know, when they had a system put in 10 years ago um, and now they buy an electric car and they want to use the solar to charge the electric car and, you know, we've got to try and make older sort of tech work and smaller systems and things like that. But, um, yeah. yeah. Do you sometimes would argue that as soon as you get an electric car and you've got a small solar, you should really upgrade? Definitely, yeah, unless you've got lots of time on your hands. We had a, we had a customer a couple of weeks ago contact us with a, uh, I think about a four kilowatt solar system and they'd bought a car with a 60 kilowatt hour uh, battery in it and they said they didn't want to upgrade the solar, they just wanted to use their excess solar to charge the car. And I sat down and went, yep, that's technically possible, but it's going to take about four or five days to, um, to you know, actually get that power in. And so, um, <laughs> yeah, so look, there's certainly many ways to skin the cat, um, but uh, yeah, certainly a decent size solar system of, you know, 10, 15 kilowatts is really what you want when you're going down that EV route. Mm. Now, you've been in the country and it's obviously a big area that you uh, install in. Um, what's the story? Are you driving an EV and are, are EVs the right thing right now for the country? What's your position? Yeah, it's a tricky one. Um, I don't have an EV and a lot of people come up to me and go, but you're in solar, you have to have one. You know, like you sell a Tesla power or battery, but you don't drive a Tesla car. And I go, well, yes, but sadly, the, the charging infrastructure is just not up to snuff yet in, in regional areas. In Armadale, there is one uh, publicly available fast charger. 
um, which is often broken. And so, you know, and it's it's worse when you get to sort of smaller areas. And so, um, when I get in the car and, you know, drive out west or somewhere like that and I'm doing 800 kilometres in a day and, you know, on gravel roads, there's just no way that current EV tech and current um, current charging uh, infrastructure can kind of accommodate that. And so while I would love to have an EV, it's just not feasible right now for, m- for me. But having said that, um, you know, our customers in town that are buying EVs are the ones that um, are doing, you know, a small commute around around town in a day in an EV and that works perfectly well. We've got uh, one guy who's a, who's a doctor. Um, he's got about 10 kilowatts of solar, uh, three Tesla Powerwalls and he bought a, an EV and um, takes that to and from work. So about 15, 20 kilometres a day and then he's got plenty of power in his batteries when he gets home to, to charge his car up and it works perfectly well for him and so he's now got zero, zero motoring costs effectively you know so mm-hmm. um it, so yeah. it really comes down to the individual horses for courses but if you got the 800k to drive a day uh ev not ready yet no that's it and uh, yeah and it's just it's it's where you are you know and mm-hmm. um yeah and uh look i think it's it's a fast moving industry and so i don't think it'll be very long before you know we have a uh fast charger at every service station mm-hmm. or something like that mm-hmm. and if that was the case then it would really really change the ball game so mm. now we all know that there is very cheap solar that gets installed in a hurry with pretty crappy product. Now, you being in the country, I couldn't imagine somebody being stupid enough to pick that kind of stuff that breaks down regularly because you out of nowhere, long part away, you're going to take a long time to repair if somebody comes. Do you have that problem? Definitely, yeah. Yep. Um, as in it's not really the local installers that are, are doing the cheap stuff, but it's often – you know, installers from the big cities that'll that'll uh, do cold calls and things like that, and try and line up five or six or ten of the same jobs, and then send a crew up from Sydney, whack them all in, and then and then and then run off back to Sydney again. And um, you know, when there's problems and things like that, they're they're nowhere to be found. So yeah, certainly it is a problem for us. But then they call you to fix it. Yes. Yep. So yeah, we uh, we we get the phone call and we ask them, oh, "Have you tried contacting the installer?" And they go, "Oh, the phone number doesn't work and the web page is down." You know, <laughs> so you can just you know, um, the the cheap solar company has done the typical you know, flog it, shut down, do a runner, start up under a new name. Oh, I give you twenty year warranty. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm gone in two years. Yeah. That's it. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. And what do you say? Do you fix it? We won't work on uh, – we won't fix up other people's installs. Um, and that's that's a policy we've developed out of getting our fingers burnt in doing so. So, um, you know, probably 10 years ago we would have. We'd go out and uh, we would – they'd say, oh, um, you know, the inverter has failed and we go, right, yeah, we'll put a new inverter in for you. But the problem is is that we become – electrically responsible for that system after when so the last one the last electrician that's there takes kind of responsibility for that system being up to requirements and up to standard and on top of that um you know we go put a good inverter in well we can bank on that inverter being good quality but the rest of the system still shoddy install and so when the customer has problems down the track uh, with their panels, for example, they kind of come back to us and went, well, you, you know, you fixed it. And Why didn't um, you see last time that there should be an issue and, that's you know, why didn't you advise me? And, yeah. then, and then you become the one that is the problem. That's it, yeah, it? that's it. So we get blamed for other people's shoddy work. And so um, we developed the policy of uh, we will not work on someone else's uh, crap. Crap <laughs> install pretty well, yeah. And so, um, but having said that, we'll more than happily pull it down. And and we're doing that fairly commonly. So, Can you give me an example? Yeah. So uh, last year we had a customer come to us and said, um, I got a solar, I've got a solar system, uh, but my power bill hasn't gone down. Can you come and have a look at it? We went out and uh, he's got a 10 kilowatt solar system, half of it mounted on the south. Um, <laughs> that's not what you do, but no, yes. no, that's it. And uh, uh, the all the wires were just sitting on the roof, no cable ties or anything. Uh, the mounting feet were every two meters, and they should be at least every meter, and, and sometimes more depending on the wind loading. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Um, and I went down and had a look at his inverters, and all the switches were off. And I said, "Did someone turn this off?" And he went, 
No, no, no. He said, oh, when the, when the guys installed it, they told me, don't touch any of the switches. And I went, but they're off. And he went, yeah, yeah. But he said, they, they specifically said, whatever you do, don't touch them. And I went, this doesn't sound right. Looked into it. No essential energy application had been made. Um, this company had come down from Brisbane. They had uh, put in five systems the exact same around Armadale and then just scarpered. And this guy tried calling him, no response, no nothing, just completely, you know, just dead, dead disappeared. Silent. Disappeared. And of course, if you do not do the application in time and appropriately, then you're actually legally not allowed to turn the that's system it. on. That's it, yeah. Which so is, that's why yeah. they told him, don't turn it on. Yeah, that's it. But yeah. he thought he had a solar system, but he more had like a Hollywood facade of a that's system. That's exactly right, yeah. So um, and so did you go and turn it on and make it work for him? Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> we said to him, uh, I said, uh, I said, we do have a magic wand to fix this, but it's called pull it all down and put up something decent. <laughs> and to his credit, he went, yeah, all right, okay. He said, you know, I, I can kind of see see the, the error here. And so um, we ripped that system down and uh, put up a lovely ground mount that was all facing north because, you know, they did north-south on the shed because that's all the roof he had. And so we went, well, that doesn't cut the mustard. And so, um, yeah, we put up a, a nice ground mount, 10 kilowatt solar system, Tesla Powerwall, and everything is going along swimmingly. So. Right. So, uh, but he would have really wasted the rebate, wasted the system. The panels would have gone into the tip. That's a big waste. It is for sure. Yeah. Yep. Um, but uh, there's not a lot you can do about that. As in, you know, we're not going to go and submit an essential energy application for someone else's install. <laughs> um, you know, it's just a, and we're certainly not going to turn it on without one. Um, and so, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a no-win situation. But I think he got out of it the best way he could. Mm. Um, and at least, you know, he never didn't pay much for the first one because it was, it was low quality. So he mm. wasn't too far out of pocket. And um, I believe he kept all the panels because they're brand new, even though they were cheap. And he's got plans for a solar pumping system sort of set up right. so yeah okay mm. wow yeah no it's 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 a shocker i mean people should really remember you buy cheap you buy twice yeah even if some famous person be the cricketer or other <laughs> sports person recommends it yeah if you buy those type of systems you're going to have to ask for a quality guy to come out later on mm. and he most likely is not willing to fix it because it's not worth fixing that's it and there's um, Benjamin Franklin has a great quote about this: that the the bitterness of poor quality remains long after the sweetness of low price is forgotten. Yes. And um, you know, it's uh, interesting in the in the Tesla training that you do when you um, uh, get certified to install Tesla batteries. They they uh, they have that quote up there during the installation, and, it, and it's good. It's good. It, it's really good that they are encouraging you know quality installs, and mm. it is very true because. You know, 15 years down the line, you don't remember the three grand you saved, but you do remember the 25 service calls that you've had to, um, you know, try and keep your solar system plodding along. Yeah. So. I, I've, I've seen one which says, um, what was promised, and there's a picture of the Mona Lisa, mm. and then what was delivered, and there's a kid's drawing of the, yeah. Mon <laughs> of the yeah, Mona yeah, Lisa. That's <laughs> yep, that's about right. Uh, yeah. uh, well, cheap solar. Mm. What a nightmare. Now, you talked about the Tesla Powerwall. Mm. Um, are you a qualified installer? What's your experience with that product? We love them. Yeah, we absolutely love them. Uh, we're, yeah, we're Tesla, uh, Tesla dealers and uh, certified installers. And um, to us, they really are the perfect battery solution for on-grid. Um, just, you know, beautiful to install, really, you know, sexy, very schmick product and great customer experience. As in, we, we have no upset Tesla customers. They all love it. Um, sure, they're not cheap and there's plenty of cheaper options, but um, uh, anyone who bites the bullet and, and, and pulls up, uh, stumps up the cash for a Tesla battery, just love it. You know, the app's so intuitive and smooth to use and, um, yeah, it's just been a lot of design and effort put into that product and it, it really shows and how it works. If you've got a 13.5 kilowatt battery, is that the right size? I think so. So, so Tesla picked that number because they reckon that gets the average household through the night. And our experience is, is yes, I would agree. 
that um, your average three or four bedroom house that's got 10 kilowatts of solar on the roof and no, you know, extreme loads like in-floor heating or, you know, stuff like that, they will get through the night on that 13.2. Um, and so, yeah, you can cut out, you know, 90 to 95% of your power bill um, if you've got a decent sized solar system and a Tesla battery with it. So you think 10 kilowatt uh, is the right size to go with the battery or what's, Dep- what's the range of systems you would recommend to go with a decent sized battery? Yeah, it all, all depends on what you're trying to do with it. Um, and so uh, someone who uh, is not at, uh, not at home all day and not use any power during the day, they can get away with a smaller solar system because all it's got to do is charge the battery Mm. um, and be ready for them to come home at night and then they run off battery. Whereas Mm. if you're at home during the day, you work at home and you've got aircon and different things running like that, then probably 10 or 15 kilowatts is more appropriate. Um, so that even in overcast weather and, you know, you've got the washing machine on and things like that, you're still getting enough power to fill up your Tesla and give you 100% for the night. Mm. Now, in your part of the world, um, do you have any issues with roof space? Because in the city, sometimes they've got small terrace houses. They can't really put a big solar system on. What's the story up your way? Yeah, a lot less of an issue. Um, it's fairly rare that we will fill all of a roof with, with solar panels. Um, you know, we certainly prioritise the north as in you can do east and west, but mm. north north is ideal and we normally just um, are able to put up the amount of kilowatts the customer wants on the northern face fairly simply, which is really good. Mm-hmm. If you would give a customer advice, what's more important, that he gets a really good deal and cheap price or that he gets the best possible system? What's your philosophy there? Definitely quality. Um, definitely quality. And it's, uh, you know, something that we've proved over the last 20, 25 years of, of, uh, of installations. Um, do it once and do it right and you won't have any trouble. Uh, we have, you know, we have systems that we put in in the 90s that are still working perfectly fine to this day. You know, we have off-grid systems that um, we had a customer call up a little while ago and said, um, oh, you know, we've had a heap of rain recently and, um, you know, the batteries are flat but the the generator won't start. And we went, oh, okay, radio. And uh, we said, um, when's the last time you ran the generator? And they said, oh, we've never started it before. <laughs> <laughs> and so so that's a testament. And so the you know, poor generator had 10-year-old petrol in it and, of course, it wouldn't start. But, um, you know, the fact that they hadn't needed to run it in the last 10 years of an off-grid solar system, you know, because they did it once and they did it right. And so, um, yeah, we, we put in good product, we put it in once and have very happy customers because of that. Do you get uh, word of mouth recommendations? Definitely. Yep. Yeah. Um, and that's the great thing. I'm very grateful. A lot of our customers will, uh, yeah, speak well about us. And, um, you know, probably once a month or so, we'll have someone come in and say, oh, Joe Bloggs bought a solar system off you. And they said, don't go anywhere else. And so I'm here. And and that's great. And we really appreciate <laughs> our customers doing that. So. Mm-hmm. What do you uh, recommend for inverter solutions? Yeah. So inverters, probably one of two, either Enphase or Feronius. Um, we're big Enphase fans. We love it. It's uh, very, very good gear. Uh, the microinverter system, whilst about probably 20 to 25% more than a string inverter system, um, you know, the balance of the extra safety being low voltage, um, individual panel monitoring, um, and just a really smooth, really smooth system. Uh, we've put in thousands of them and we've had one microinverter fail out of all of that. And that was out of the box. So presumably some kind of manufacturing issue mm. and, you know, no troubles, contacted end phase, another one there two days later. And so that's it, you know. Um, so we're very happy with them um, and uh, put in a lot of them. And so if you really want the bee's knees, go end phase. But it is, you know... Um, that that 25% more cost for the same kilowatt output. So you really got to decide whether that 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 extra um, I suppose reassurance um, <coughs> and monitoring abilities and things like that is is, is worth the money to you. Um, yeah. But one point here. Mm. The one thing to consider is that you're looking at maybe a two thousand dollar income out of that system, and if you pay twelve hundred dollars more for the end phase versus the non-end phase solution, you're only looking at maybe an eight months extra period to wait to get your money back. But that's in a 25-year time frame. So instead of two years and eight months, 
you might wait three years and six months because before you got your money in your pocket. That's not that bad for getting the best. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Mm. And um, a lot of people go down that route and I certainly, yeah. Is that what you recommend it. to them? Definitely, yeah. Yep. As in if um, if you're looking for the best, you know, fork out that extra money for microinverters and, and Enphase specifically, yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Now, you don't have um, any corrosion issues because you're far away from the coast. Yep. Um, what about racking? Is that important? Um, yeah, the, the racking is interesting. As in, when we first started, it didn't exist. <laughs> it was, um, it, and uh, we built all our frames out of galvanized steel, custom in the shed. And so um, we actually had a guy employed whose whole job was to was to build these frames that we, you know, screw into the panels and then screw to the roof. Wow. Um, and so, you know, Clenergy came along and kind of have reinvented all of that into that very modular um sort of uh, simple racking system. Um, and so, yeah, as in the racking is fairly simple, um, but just I think the main thing is that it's installed well, you know, as in <clears> you can put up good racking badly or you can put up bad racking well, <laughs> if you know what I mean, it's just, um, but uh, yeah, so it's more the install, I think, than the racking because at the end of the day, it's just bits of aluminium. It's not that sort of complicated. So. But uh, I suppose some cheaper companies would think you can't see the you know, the clamps and all the um, feet under the panels. So by putting a few layers, I save a few bucks. Mm. And so I have seen stuff rather flimsy. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. And um, But, yeah, we're kind of the opposite way that I'd prefer to put in more feet and more more clamps and um, guarantee that that's going to survive whatever freak weather, mm. whatever freak weather we have. And we've proved that that's the case. Armadale had a, a tornado in, uh, I think it was uh, 2019, 2020, which is very strange for us. We don't have any of that kind of tropical weather. And um, afterwards, you drive around Armadale, there were entire roofs off the house on the ground, but the solar panels were still on the roof. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of mine. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and so I was like, yep, well, uh, uh, racking is better than the roof was. So, yep. If yep. I would have been the owner, I would have rung you crankily. Why didn't you see my roof wasn't good enough yeah. and you could have fixed it on the day? <laughs> oh, dear, so dear. so um, what are the people in Armadale like? Are they get cranky quickly because they get too much sun or are they not? Nice people, what are they like? Um, yeah, and I apologize for saying that. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, yeah, Armadale has a lot of sun and they reckon vitamin D is good for your mental health. And so, we're, I think, we're a very friendly, lovely bunch up there. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's uh, I think country people, um, it's interesting. I think the further remote you get, uh, the more. Uh, the more generous and accommodating people sort of become. Um, and I think that's just kind of by nature of where you are, you know, as in uh, if you're out in the middle of nowhere and you see someone broken down the side of the road, you don't drive past them because it could be six hours till another car does, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Yeah. And so that kind of uh, country spirit kind of comes into a bit. And so, um, yeah, we got a lot of farmers that come in and, um, uh, yeah, it's uh, people are, I'd say, fairly trusting, which is good. I mean, it's good. When in, in terms of us, because we look after them and, and respect that trust, but it's not good with cheap companies because um, people will just sign up and go, "Yep, okay, I trust you," you know, whatever, and then they get they get their fingers burnt. Um, and so, yeah, I suppose trusting quality is the important part rather than just trusting anyone. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, do you sometimes have to go to service calls that's like many hundreds of k's away and? How do you handle that? I mean, you wouldn't make money on that. No, and um, yeah, it, it certainly depends. So off-grid customers always get very high priority for us um, in terms of service calls. As in, um, if someone with a solar system on grid their system doesn't work. Of course, we're going to get out there and fix it as soon as possible, but they've still got power. Someone with off-grid that doesn't have it, um, they've got nothing and their fridge is getting warm and they've got no lights and it's... Um, yeah, it gets, gets a bit boring for yeah, the kids. Yeah, I've um, I've done some some crackers and and two come to mind. Um, I had uh, uh, one guy in Scone um, who uh, his off grid system he had a problem with it and he couldn't get it to work and he'd lost power overnight. And I got in the Ute and left Armadale at about seven or eight o'clock at night. And drove all the way down there, so about 10 o'clock or so arrival, <laughs> um, got his system up and running um, and left there about midnight, 1am, uh, drove back a bit, had a bit of a nap in the ute, 
and then woke up and drove back. And by the time I got there, it was time for work. And so I went straight back into work again the next, wow. next morning. Um, what was wrong with his system? Um, so, yeah, interesting. So he had uh, he had three Tesla Powerwalls and um, when we put it in, we advised him to, to get a backup generator, but he – he said, oh, yeah, well, I'll kind of look at it down the track. And we went, okay, yep, sure, that's fine. And so because um, he didn't have a generator and had about a week of rain, um, his batteries went flat. And so because there was no generator to kind of to, to kickstart that, um, uh, yes, it just, yeah, kind just, of. Just died, died for that reason. That's it, so did yeah. you bring a generator with you? Uh, yes. Did you have one yeah. on the ute that yeah. allowed you to start and yeah. and trickle charge it a bit? Yeah, and we got him going. Oh, so, um, okay. okay. But look, that, that's just the thing we do. And I think, you know, I think I think I charged him three or $400 for that service call, which, which doesn't come close to um, – being the value, I suppose, of, of my time and, you know, driving through the night, <laughs> not being in my bed that night. And, but, and quite um, frankly, yeah. it wasn't actually your problem. No, that's it. But, but um, you know, we take – we take a lot of responsibility for our systems and it was important to me that that, that guy got up and running as soon as possible, you know, mm. and food mm. in his fridge didn't go off and and you know, all of that all of that kind of stuff. So um, you know, we had another one. I had a I had a family um a uh, big family gathering where all the family had gotten together and and stuff and uh, we had a, a customer about two and a, two hours away again who um, whose uh, generator was starting but it wasn't charging the system and um, anyway I was kind of texting backwards and forwards and trying to advise remotely and things like that and eventually he went nah look I just I got no idea and this is you know I, can you come and have a look at it and I went oh yeah right and this is, <laughs> isn't going to go down well with the family but um, and he went yeah I know but like we've got a newborn baby so, so and you I had can't big, you had a big up. family yes. event, did you yeah. and you yep. had to say see you guys so <laughs> I walked into the family event late from work and then five minutes later I walked out again <laughs> and got in the ute and drove down but yeah but he pulled the whole you know new born baby and we can't heat, heat a milk up with and I went oh yeah okay. of course yes I'll, I'll be there I'm coming and so yeah driving down the rain and uh, again uh, just had a capacitor go out in the generator and so um, switched that over and got him going and got the baby's milk warm and came home again so um, but again that's that, that kind of stuff it's not about the money it's about um, when a customer hands over sixty, eighty thousand dollars to us for, for, big, for, uh, for a big off grid yeah. system mm. um when they do that, uh, that's you know a a vote of trust in us that we're going to look after them if things go wrong in the future. It's not just whack it in and forget about it. It's put it in and then be there for that entire lifetime it's, it's, of the system. It's a relationship there, and that's look. It. At your family event, mate, you still got the leftovers. <laughs> yeah, it's the first guy get a um, So yeah, and so we value that trust. Uh, and yeah. so, yeah. and uh, the first guy was he smart enough to buy your generator off the back of the Ute, or he did no, he hasn't bought one yet. Um, oh. But yeah, <laughs> I just think he watches his app very closely. <laughs> but um, so uh, yeah, look, my advice is if you do get an off grid system, even if you get a really good battery sizing. A generator just there as a maybe mm, definitely. Uh, is is really what you want as well because yep. you could get a whole week of rain. Mm. You decide to bake a cake. Uh, your batteries are relatively flat, and batteries don't like being flat for long, long time. Mm. So you could even cause damage to the system. So I think the smart thing is to have it just in case. Definitely, and and it's it's not a big expense. As in, you know, you don't have to have a massive. Uh, you know, diesel generator. You can buy something for two thousand dollars. That's um, you know, like power light so generator that we sell. They're little uh, ones with Honda motors on them, and you know, put out about six or eight kilowatts. And you know, that's not an enormous amount, mm. but it, it'll do something. You know, mm. and um, mm. you can just throw that in the shed. And if you're a farmer, take it out welding and do whatever you want to do with it. But just have that there so that yeah, you can plug that in in mm. a in a you know yeah. low solar scenario. So when you pick your gear, you say you talked about using Tesla, using Enphase, using Fronius, they're all quality brands. Mm. I mean, how do you pick your gear, your panels, your things? Do you just go? <laughs> no, definitely not. Um, it's a very painstaking process because um, I kind of take the philosophy that I've done the research so the customer doesn't have to as much. Um, you know, they can they can do the research on the installer more than on the product um, because we've kind of done that done that for them. Um, 
And so it, it's tricky because there is so much cheap gear out there and so much cheap gear that if you don't look closely, it looks like the expensive gear. You know, you pull up a, a, a brochure for a, a cheap panel and an expensive panel, they've got the same warranties, they've got the same watts of output, they've got the same weight. And so you just look, it's, it's you know, you can be forgiven for looking at that and going, and, and well- And they're on the roof yeah, five metres away, they all look the same, same anyway. That's it, exactly. And so, um, you know, sadly, you can't put up a solar panel, leave it there for 20 years, and then if it is fine in 20 years' time, then decide to sell it. Do you know what I mean? Because the solar market is moving so quickly. Um, and so you've got to, it's, you've got to take a punt on what's going to last. And so we do that, but we do that in a very conservative way with a lot of research. And it's looking into the company that's making it. Are they big? Are they established? Are they quality focused? Who are their distributors? Are they using a reputable wholesaler that's going to be there in a long time? You know, how are they making it? Um, you know, what is the quality and the feel of the panel like? Because you can, um, you can even feel it between cheap and expensive quality. The edges are different, and and you know the frames are floppy and all of that sort of stuff. Mm. So you, you can feel it, and so we we do quite an extensive you know amount of research to try and pick. Um, pick the best quality panels that, you know, because we're going to be there in 20 years' time. And so I want to make sure that the panels we're putting up now are going to be there as well. Yeah, so. because especially in the regions, mate, you don't want to travel long distances and have excuses. That's it, definitely. Mm, yeah. Okay. Um, now, they all say there is something coming which is kind of the electrification of the home that heat pumps will be the majority of ways to make hot water and all that. Do you educate customers about that when you're trying to size their solar system? Yeah, it uh, it depends on the customer. Um, some people uh, just prefer a simple solution. They just, they just want to put up solar and have their bill reduced and, and that's that. Other people get right into it and want to, you know, um, go right into have all uh, the apps yeah have the apps and have protocols and automated things and you know IFTT integration and and that's fine and we'll work with either either side of the spectrum with that um Heat pumps are an interesting one. Uh, I think they've come a long way. When they originally came out, they were utterly hopeless in Armadale because Armadale, for anyone who doesn't know, gets very cold. Um, in the middle of winter, we'll get days that don't get above zero in the middle of the day and down to minus 10 at night. And so um, a heat pump that's supposed to be extracting a bit of heat out of the air, well, there's no heat in the air. <laughs> and so they, they uh, yeah, weren't very effective. Having said that, they've come a long way and the current generation ones are, are pretty good and will you know still work fairly well well in the in the winter um we don't push them much because in our experience um you're better to put up another two kilowatts of pv and put in a timer on your traditional element hot water system and just let it go um, because the timer is 200 dollars installed versus thousands for a heat pump and it's it's very simple and very robust and you know will still achieve the same goal of zero dollars spent on hot water heating so to explain that to our viewers, in the middle of the day, you usually generate a lot of solar. And so if you time your hot water to be generated by electricity in that time frame when you have really good solar output, then normally you would literally use your solar to heat your hot water because your timer is turning it on and off That's in that yeah. time frame. Yeah. And therefore you get literally free solar from the sun mm. because the old solar heart style solar hot water heaters, they're a little bit on the way out now. Yeah, though. definitely. And, and even like the evacuated tube, you know, more sort of upgraded types. Mm -hmm. um, we we used to sell them but haven't for 10 years or so just because of the reliability. There's so much going on. There's pumps and valves and there's sensors and um, there's so many things. It only takes one of them, you know, to, to fail and your whole system doesn't work. And so we stopped selling them at least 10 years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, just much prefer the simple timer method. And especially, you know, um, sadly, Essential Energy, who, who uh, you know, run all the infrastructure up around where we are, they don't give anyone in town more than a five kilowatt export limit and out of town three. And so if you've put up 10 or 15 kilowatts and you're not there during the day, well, you're only sending out five and yet your other five is being throttled and your solar inverter just has to wind down. And so when you um, put in a timer, 
you're allowing the solar system to produce more. So now, you know, you've got a 3.6 kilowatt element. And so now your 10 kilowatt system is able to produce 8.6 or so. Mm. And um, yeah, it's just really is, it really is free hot water for $200. So it just. So it's a bit like yeah. a battery, but uh, you're actually sending it into the hot water tank. It is, yeah. And you're still storing energy, yeah, yeah. and in a very affordable way. And um, especially when you don't have to modify your element or your hot water system, everyone, everyone's got a traditional mm. tank mm. and mm. element, and mm. you just. Hook it up to hook it up on a timer and off they go. So, so what do you do to educate people? Because the feed-in tariff, which is the money that you get paid to export solar, obviously there have been big changes where it's come mm. less and less and less. How do you explain that to customers? Yeah, it's um, it's a tricky one, and I do feel like um, solar customers get the raw end of the deal with that in the sense that, you know, their power is sold back into the grid and we've got people down to like two or three cents per kilowatt now. And then that power is uh, being sold to someone else at 30, you know, up to 38, 40 cents of, of what we're seeing now. And so um, there is big money being made by the power companies out of that solar export. Um, but yeah, it's just a reality that there's not going to be money in exports going, you know, forward. Um, and I think that's a mixture of utilities. I have a different sold. theory. You don't agree? I yeah. do have a different theory because I think when the electric car comes in big numbers, mm. then they might introduce a special tariff in the middle of the day to absorb all the solar that's being generated, at which point the value would be higher and you would actually get a little bit more. So I actually think the low feed-in tariffs might be more of a temporary thing because mm. also the energy retailers really got to build batteries to absorb it and then have it available for night. So I think there is a change in infrastructure that will change this a little bit. But yeah, hopefully we, we don't yeah. know. And I hope you're right because um, you know it's great if you can export power and get paid a bit for it. Um, you know that helps you with your nighttime loads and it helps you with your daily supply charges, which are getting very high. You know we're seeing. Up two dollars, two dollars fifty a day in your in part of the daily world. Supply oh my god! Yeah. In Sydney, it's still below a dollar. Yeah. So um, if you, you know, so to, it, it's great if you can export a bunch of power and enough to cover your supply charge. That's mm. awesome. Mm. Um, so yes, but uh, anyway, we'll just have to see how the see mm. how the industry goes. But do one. the low feed-in tariffs uh, annoy people to the point that they actually decide to go with a battery? Um, Probably part of the reason, but I, I think for most of our customers, uh, the battery argument is either a environmental one or a self-sufficiency one. Um, it's either, you know, uh, I want to ensure that I am immune from blackouts and can use my own energy and feel good about that, or it's, you know... Um, yeah, that uh, they don't want to be using coal power at night and, you know, exporting solar into the grid during the day. So, uh, yeah, but certainly, um, yes, the, the lack of economic incentive to send power back into the grid would certainly help with, with the argument to buy a battery. Mm -hmm. Now, you might be at an install, your crew has travelled 200 k's, they forgot to end phase microinverters or something like that. Uh, maybe you say it never happens, but I'm sure something happens sometimes. How do you deal with unexpected issues during install? Um, yeah, look, it's uh, it's tricky because there's always a balance between uh, making money so that you can stay in business and um, providing providing, you know, uh, great customer service. And we certainly are on the side of the customer service rather than the, <laughs> the, the making the money side. And so if there's a decision like that, it's just got to be the right thing for the customer. You know, if we forgot a microinverter and we're going to drive back, well, that's on us. We stuffed up. Someone's got to get in the ute and drive back to Armadale and pick that up. And let's just not do that again next time. You know, that's not on the customer. They still deserve the best quality best quality install from us. Well, what about if the sales guy didn't notice that there was a lot of asbestos in the switchboard and you guys stuck there on, I don't know, extra costs? or? Yeah, again, we wear most of that because, again, that's on us. We should have we should have picked that if that happens. And so, um, yeah, it's just that's not on the customer. And so, you know, it's um, much prefer to have a happy customer than have another 500 bucks in the bank account. Mm. 
Excellent. <laughs> now, when you do install, do you explain to the customer the installation process? I mean, does it take five days? Does it take a day? Can you run it through a typical installation process? Yeah. So uh, we'll uh, get an inquiry from a customer. Um, that will turn into a site visit. We really like to go out and have a look at the, the site before we do a quote because, as you say, there can be so many different variables, um, you know, shading and, and uh, roof location and uh, all sorts of different things, a meter location and all sorts of stuff. And so we go out and, uh, and do a site visit. And then once we've done the site visit and had a good chat to the customer about what they're hoping to achieve with solar, come back to the office uh, write up a quote for them and take it out. If they like it, they, they sign the contract. And uh, then we uh, go off and do the essential energy application, which we're required to do to get essential energy's permission to put up a solar system that is connected to their grid. So we do that. And then uh, while that's being processed, we start ordering stock and getting all that in. Then uh, we get the essential energy approval and uh, get all the stock together and then go out and start the install. Um, most installs are two or three days, um, maybe a bit more if it's a big off-grid or batteries and things like that, a bit more complexity, but an on-grid system is probably two or three days at the most. Um, get do you, that done. Do you can do sometimes a smaller one in a day? Yes, yeah, yeah. But mm -hmm. um, it's rare that we do small systems now. Most people are wanting eight to 15 kilowatts. Mm. And so, um, yeah, that's just being a lot of panels and things like that, um, you know, it tends to take up a bit more time. Um, but yes, and so once that's done, then we uh, set the customer up with their with their monitoring system and, and um, yeah, off we go on to the uh, next one. Is it like, for example, in Sydney, most companies try to smack it out in a day, mm. but then they possibly don't also have the heat in the middle of the day. Does that stop you sometimes to continue with the job? Yeah, it does. Yeah, middle of summer. Middle of summer, you've got to be certainly careful. Make sure your, <laughs> your workers don't get overheated on the roof. Um, and again, in winter, uh, you know, there's frost on the roof in some places till mm. 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning. And so um, it's, of course, a bad idea to be up on the roof then. So, um, yeah, weather weather certainly is a consideration, but I think we just try, you try and be smart with how you plan your install and um, set yourself up so that you've got work that isn't on the roof at the times that you can't be on the roof, if that makes sense. So no, doing the yeah. inverter and doing the stuff in the roof and switchboards and all of that sort of stuff, um, do that in the, in the bad weather times. Got it, got it. Mm. Some customers nowadays who are looking at solar might wonder, should they have solar only or solar and a battery? What's your advice? Look, definitely solar and a battery. Um, I know it's it's uh, easy to say that and it's harder to come up with the cash for that, especially when you're buying good quality gear. But it's just a future-proofing thing that I think is really essential. Um, you know, uh, to be able to protect yourself from blackouts, to be able to utilize your own energy and to be on the path where you have a house that is set up for an EV when if you choose to go down that route in the future. I think that's just really, really important. And, um, you know, power prices are not doing anything but going up. And so even if you look at the return on investment on a battery right now, um, it's only going to get better. As you bite the bullet now and jump in and then, um, you know, uh, you know, in over the next 10 years, as power prices go up to, you know, possibly 50, 60 cents a kilowatt, um, unless we see some really radical change, then you're going to be laughing by the end of that 10 year period because you will have made a really, really solid return on investment and had no blackouts in between. Um, we've got a, we've got a customer that, um, his wife was not very happy about the idea of spending the money on a battery and he was very for it and um, obviously he won the argument. And uh, they, that's, that's a rare occasion, it is, yeah, the, anyway, the man so winning the argument. It is, but um, <laughs> he, he won the argument and they, they put a Tesla in and, anyway, and she was just kind of like, oh, whatever. Anyway, I don't really see the point. Anyway, she was at work, came home one night and drove through an entirely black Armadale because there was a blackout all through the town. And she came home and as, as she got home, he turned every single light on the house on <laughs> and he said, welcome home, honey. Do you notice anything different? <laughs> every light he could find, he had it on. And she went, yeah, all right, okay. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I don't know if she liked him any better after that night. <laughs> no, but he proved a point. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Mm, mm. Yeah. One win, lose the war. That's anyway. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's funny. Um Customers probably want to know how they can save money on solar. A, do you save money on solar? And B, how do you calculate it? 
Yeah. Um, it's, I think it's about matching the solar size to your requirements. Um, more is not always better. You know, uh, most people, 20 kilowatts of solar is overkill. And so if you put that up, well, your return on investment is going to be lower because it's going to take you longer to pay that back. And so um, your savings come from uh, sizing the system appropriately to your usage mm. um, and buying good quality so that that system continues to produce for a long time. Um, we've seen solar systems that are down to 50% of their theoretical production after two years. Because the degradation of yep. the gear. Yes. Right. And so um, and water getting in between the 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 glass and the silicon and, and it's just a, it's just a disaster. And so, you know, you buy a five kilowatt system, all of a sudden you've got a two and a half kilowatt fire hazard. Um, whereas if you had have bought a good one, then you've still got a you know a system that will be producing um, you know eighty percent of its of its nominal number sort of after twenty years or so. And so mm. that's um yeah, yeah, that's mm. certainly the way to save the money. I do feel for consumers because the cheap stuff, when you look at it, it says that it's a bill buster mm. and it has a 10-year warranty on this and a 25-year warranty on this. So why wouldn't I trust that? And how can that trick me? I mean, I've got the warranty. Yeah, that's it. And um, look, the warranty is a really tricky one because if you look in fine print, most of them are performance warranties. And so um, what that means is that they're saying that if the panel is still functioning, it will be functioning at above this amount. However, if the panel fails, that's not void in the performance warranty. That's a replacement warranty, which the panel may only have a short uh, span of. And so they're very clever in their wording of that. And so if you come and say, oh, my panel's, you know, burnt out or whatever, they go, oh, well, that's not within warranty. And you're like, but it's in the 25 years. And they're like, yeah, but that's not under the performance warranty. And so, um, you know, there's that. But there's also the fact that these, the cheap companies, uh, the cheap installers, the cheap retailers, and the cheap manufacturers never last long. You know, I can't list the amount of companies that have that have uh, you know eight, over eight hundred. I've actually did a count. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so they come and go, and so a warranty with a company that doesn't exist is not worth the paper it's written on. Mm. You know, and especially if even if that manufacturer is still functioning but overseas, well, good luck trying to apply Australian consumer law to a company that doesn't have an Australian presence. Oh no, no, no! I had one once which said we do still honour the warranty, but you've got to ship the panels overseas to our factory. <laughs> <laughs> to check them. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So the, the shipping yeah. was more than the panel was worth. Yeah. Um, the other one is that when you have a performance warranty and you say, listen, suddenly this thing has just stopped working, it's still blinking a little bit, but not mm. much. They force you to have them professionally tested to prove to them that they don't work, which means you've got to send them to the one test lab available in Canberra. Mm. And again, getting them off, shipping them is or costing you more than the panel is worth it. So yeah. there's a lot of that kind of sly grog movement that's mm, going on definitely. when it comes to solar warranties, yeah. but always with the cheap companies. Definitely. And so that's the thing. And in my mind, the most bulletproof warranty is good quality. Because yeah. there's no, you know, and and, yeah. <laughs> and the irony is, is that those companies actually do honour their warranty, but they don't need to because they don't cause trouble. You know, like Fronius Inverters have got ten year warranty, and golly, I don't think we've claimed. I can't remember claiming one. You know, so mm. um, they just they just kind of the good gear just keeps on going. You know, so um, yeah. I do know of one Fronius that failed once when a gecko somehow made its way into the machine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had a few blown up by lightning, but that's certainly not. Not, certainly not on Ferronius. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm a customer. I'm calling you up. I want solar. What are the questions you're going to ask me? Um, what do you hope to achieve? As in, are you looking for self-sufficiency? Are you looking for blackout protection or EV charging or a lower bill? Um, so what are your objectives? Um, lower bill, please. Lower bill, please. Yeah. Um, uh, so uh, lower bill, we would... Just advise pretty well. Just go solar. Get solar that matches your uh, your usage, so you can look at the bill. And if uh, you know the average house is kind of twenty four kilowatt hours or so, twenty four thirty kilowatt hours a day, six hundred dollar bill a quarter, something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's it. And so um, 
we say to them, okay, well then um, we look at that and we try and figure out roughly what their daytime usage is and then we design a, a solar system that covers that daytime usage and that's going to be the system that's going to give them the best best return on investment, especially if, you know, as we we're talking about before with hot water timers, we can add the hot water in and, and uh, you know, do things like um, if you've got off-peak hot water, then you've got a second meter that is doing that and there is a supply charge on that meter. And then if we come in and put a time on your hot water, you can call up your electricity company and say, get rid of my off-peak meter, please, and immediately you've just lost the supply charge and you're back down to one. Mm. And so... Um, I, I don't think you lost it, that. you saved it, really. Yeah, certainly, <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, and, and look, there's, there's a really good and really good return on investment on that stuff, especially if you can use a lot of your own power during the mm. day. Mm. Um, we've got a customer recently um, sent me uh, through a text of their most recent power bill. Uh, they have a five kilowatt solar system and no battery and their bill was $23 for the last quarter. Wow, that's and a good so result. you can't say much better than that. Mm. So, yeah. 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 Now, um, what kind of maintenance do I need on solar? There's no moving parts, etc. Do I just leave it and... Pretty well. Um, yeah, we've... Uh, in our sort of, uh, you know, research, we... Cleaning doesn't seem to make much difference. And I'll put a caveat on that. If it's heavy things like a heavy layer of dust or lichen and moss and stuff like that, absolutely needs to be cleaned off. But a small, you know, when you look at a panel and look at it's dirty, we uh, have recorded the output of the system before and after and you really can't tell the difference. And so there's very little, if anything, to be done. If you want to, you can kind of ask for the system to come and be checked and we will turn up and we'll check it and make sure everything's working working but um, you know really just watching your monitoring and, and watching your power bill and as long as it all stays consistent then then it's all good to go and you can just pretty well forget about it and let it do its thing. I would put a little caveat to it which is if you're close to coastal regions mm. there are sometimes issues that can come through with corrosion Yes, and yeah. so I would say that in a coastal area you possibly would want to look at your system a little bit more often especially also with strong winds that just come mm. and go which can also rattle things loose. Yeah. You might not have those same issues. No, definitely in, not. There's yeah. no, yeah, none of our customers are anywhere near the sea. So, yeah, I mean, <laughs> grateful we don't have the corrosion issues. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, what do you think the industry is going to move into the next two to five years? Yeah, look, it's a tricky one to predict. The solar industry is a, is a really funny one and is fairly heavily affected by government policy. Um, and so, you know, we've been through so many different government schemes that, um, you know, bring in and kind of send the industry mad for a couple of years and then go away. And so it, it really depends what government do and what they do in terms of incentives. Um, but I think the big thing is going to be uh, the installation of batteries. You know, we've got solar on one in three houses in Australia now. And so that's probably not too far off um the people that are going to buy it have, if that makes sense. You know, the people that are left are, are renters or, um, you know, units or, you know, things that don't have suitable roofs and stuff like that. And so to me, it's it's going back to that one third of the Australian households and putting in a battery of some sort to, um, you know, not only help with their, you know, their nighttime loads and, 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 and grid independence and stuff like that, but also on a, on a national level, you know, try and uh, secure up the grid a bit, which is, you know, <laughs> which at times can certainly get fairly unstable. So. Mm -hmm. I mean, also, if you'd have the battery, then the export limits would stop, which is where you maybe have a 10 kilowatt system, but you're only allowed to send five out. Mm. But as soon as you have a battery, would then that change that circumstances? So no, that doesn't change the export limit, but um, it changes how well you can utilize your solar. So rather than your solar just winding back and doing very little apart from covering your loads, it's got, you know, 13.2 kilowatt hours it can pump into your battery during mm. the day. Mm. And mm. so, yeah, you're getting more out of the system. Yeah, okay. so more energy from it. I heard that there is a program called Amber that mm. helps you earn more money with your battery. Can you explain how it works? Yeah, so Amber Amber Electric is really interesting. Um, we use them uh, at our office and I've got a, a bunch of customers on there. Pretty well the idea is that um, a normal electricity company charges you um, a daily supply charge and then they charge you for the power you use and that power is a fixed price but changes during the day. So you've got peak, off-peak, shoulder and they're different prices. And so um, 
that's just that's just what it is. And whatever time you use your power, they bill it, and that's that. But what's happening on the back end of that is in the national energy market. Um, the power price is going up and down all the time. It's a bit like the stock 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 exchange. It's just constantly fluctuating, and it's fluctuating based upon supply and demand. And so, in the middle of the day. Um, you know, uh, the grid might be 60% renewables and power could be down to, um, you know, a few, a, a few cents a kilowatt. And so, but then uh, the sun goes down and everyone comes home and starts using power and the power price will go right up. So, what Amber have done is they charge you $15 a month and then they pass on the wholesale power price, whatever that may be. And so in the middle of the day, power is worth nothing. And sometimes power is negative sometimes. And so you can uh, very rarely, but very, theoretically, you could get paid for using power if there's way too much of it in the grid and they're trying to trying to get rid of it. Mm. Um, so during the day, power is incredibly cheap. It's a bit more expensive uh, at night. And so we only really recommend Amber to people with batteries because they're using their own energy rather than buying in power, which can be 2 or $3 a kilowatt. Mm, mm. But the really cool thing with Amber is that Amber works in with, uh, with Tesla and a few other batteries so that when the power price gets really high, and I'm talking about $13 a kilowatt sometimes. Um, kilowatt can, hour? Yeah, $13 per kilowatt hour. Amber can control your battery if you want to want them to. So of course it's an opt-in thing and you can pick how you how you mm. want to work with it. But uh, you can set it up so that Amber automatically discharge your battery into the grid and sell power out of your battery and then you get paid whatever that price is. A very so, high price. Very high price. And mm. so there's people that have made fifty, sixty dollars in a night um, just by sending their, letting their battery export to the grid, and the great thing about it, it's automatic. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to be there and watching it and dial in, every- buy now, sell now. You just set, <laughs> set your app and say what, how you want your battery to mm, perform. Mm, whether mm. you're more concerned about self consumption or, or making money out of selling, and um, yeah, and just let it go, and um, that just kind of comes up as a credit on your bill. So it's a very clever and very different way of uh, of looking at electricity stuff. So yeah. so this type of program will help you to actually get your return of investment better on your battery. Yeah, for sure, I would say so. Um, and the other the other people that works well for our businesses. So, you know, our office, we're with Amber and it works great for us because uh, when power is expensive at night, we're not there. So we don't have a battery, but we've got a bunch of solar on the roof. And um, yeah, during the day, even if it's raining or something like that, and we've got the air conditioners running and we don't have enough power to uh, to cover our own loads, well, we're buying it in at only a few cents. And then mm. we all go home, power price goes up, but we're not using anything. And so our power bills are about $60 a quarter or something like that, which again, it's just just nothing. It's great. And so especially for not having a battery, it's, um, yeah, so, so businesses and residential customers with a battery, um, Amber is definitely worth a look at. Right, right. Now, you said you're offering mainly Enphase and Fronius mm. as the inverter solution. Can you explain to people who don't know anything about that what the difference is? Yeah. So, one is microinverter, one string inverter. And so, uh, string inverter is the conventional, traditional way of doing things. And so, uh, it's called string because you hook the panels up in a string. So, you hook them up in series, negative to positive, and they build up into a really high voltage, up to sort of four or 500 volts. And then you bring those wires down into one big inverter that turns the DC from the panels into AC that you can use in your house. Mm, mm. Very established technology, very reliable. Fronius have been doing it for a long time and, um, you know, absolutely nothing wrong with the way of doing that. Uh, the, the downsides of that are that you can only see what your solar system is producing. You can't see what each panel is producing. The other part is that if you have a complicated roof where you've got panels kind of scattered all over the place rather than one nice big square mm-hmm. block, it's a lot easier to do that with microinverters because you're not trying to run the strings together and hook them all up. And there's a whole bunch of different design considerations where you can't have um, panels on different directions hooked together in the same string because they don't perform very well. And so so that, that Fronius system you know, works very well and um, a lot of people have it and a lot are very happy with it. If you want to go the next step, so you've got the shading or you're really keen on getting the absolute best of the best um, or you're really keen on the really high quality monitoring and high detail monitoring, then you go in phase and rather than having that one big inverter on the wall, you have, one, you have a little inverter behind every solar panel. 
And so we put the rail up, then we put the inverters up, and then we put the panels up and plug each panel into the inverter. So Into the, the micro-inverter. Into the micro-inverter. Mm. So there's a safety argument there that you've never got more than 40 volts DC running on your roof, um, which is, which is you know, just a bit of comfort, I suppose. Um, you know, uh, you can put your panels wherever you like. Just put them up anywhere and they will all perform, perform as well as each individual panel can. If you do a string system... If you've got uh, one panel that's shaded and the rest of the string in full sun, that panel, most people think that panel will just not work, but that panel actually drags down the rest of the string. And so it, you're not just losing the 300 watts of the panel, you're losing way more than that because it's, it's pulling the rest of the system down from, from that shade. Whereas that's not the case with Enphase. You, could, you only lose what that panel is that's shaded. Um, and so you will get more output over a year, yeah. especially if you have shade. Yes. In, in, in With the end phase, you will make more money long term than with the string in a shaded situation. That's it, yep. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, yes, more more kilowatt hours per year mm. produced um, and uh, yeah, great for those kind of, uh, you know, all over the place kind of roofs and things like that. Um, but yeah, and also the monitoring is is great. Um, and so if you're the kind of person that really likes to pour into the detail of what your system is doing, um, Enphase have got a great uh, system called Enlighten and you log in there and um, you can see your roof and see all your panels and they're all different colours and show you what each individual panel has produced that day. And so um, dark green means it, ha so dark blue means it hasn't produced much and light blue means it's produced a lot. And so um, you can look at it and go, oh, Okay, I can see these in this corner here. Mm. They're not producing much, and that's because of that big pine tree I've got out the front. Mm. Mm. And so you can go, rightio, that's that's interesting. And so you call the arborist up and say, blah, 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 blah. "We're not cutting trees down. No, here. We're, we're trimming trees, <laughs> Marcus. We're right, trimming trees." You right, call them right. up. You call the arborist <laughs> and say, "Can you take a few limbs off for me?" And they take a few limbs off, and uh, then all of a sudden you can see, you know, your dark blue solar panels are all of a sudden light blue. And so it's it's um yeah, it's just got some really nice kind of uh, very high detail monitoring there. Mm -hmm. um, and you can just be sure that every panel is producing. What what it should be is you can compare them and you can go, right, well, that panel produced 1.1 kilowatts hours today and um, that's roughly the same as all of them. Well, then everything's good. You know, that, that kind mm -hmm. of be able to compare it. Um, whereas if you've got one panel that isn't working properly in a string, it's really hard to tell without getting up there and testing it. Mm. Now, the Fronius inverter that you recommend, it is one of the more expensive ones mm. on the market. Why don't you sell a bit of a cheaper Chinese inverter? Well, again, because we've done our homework and particular Fronius, we've been selling them for at least 20 years um, and they just don't give trouble. The Austrians know what they're doing um, and we're very, very happy with that. We also find that um, customers uh, have got a lot more trust in a non-Chinese based company. And so when we come up and we say, um, here's a Fronius inverter and they go, where's it made? And we say Austria. They go, oh, great. Okay, that's good. You know, there's just kind of seems to be a bit, a bit of inherent trust um, from that that country of manufacture, which, which is really good. And I think it's certainly a warranted trust as well because, yeah, as I said, we've got an incredibly low failure rate with them um, and they work well, very high efficiency, um, you know, good monitoring, uh, and, you know, a very robust, very robust, sturdy inverter that um, – because you've got to remember, you know, panels, uh, we're talking 25, 30-year lifespan, and I would argue with good ones even longer. And so if you've got an inverter that's only going to last you 10 years, well, you're going to put in three inverters to – Keep over, up with the yeah. over the lifetime of your solar mm -hmm. panels, mm -hmm. and so um, my argument is, why not just put one, put the good one in to start with that should last as long as your solar panels will. Mm, okay, I mean, thirty years for an inverter is a long time. It is, but seen it happen. Mm. Um, yeah, as in, uh, we don't have any Fronius's that are thirty years yet, but we would have twenty-five year old Fronius's. Early 2000s ones, um, the good old IG30s, <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they're still running, um, you know, and things like uh, we do have, there, there is uh, 90s era Selectronic inverters 
um, before they had SP Pro, you remember the old little white mm. and mm. white and blue inverter things? Mm. There's we have some of them still going to this day. Wow. Still producing power. And so, you know, um it's electronic, awesome Australian made product and you know it's it's uh, stands the test of time. Great for off grid. Mm. Um now I don't know if you employ subcontractors to do your work or if you have in-house staff. What's your thought about subbies versus in-house staff for the installation? Yeah, look, we've gone down both paths. Um, it, it, it's tricky. Uh, it's tricky to know, and I would I would say that there's not a uh, there's not a wrong wrong answer. To me, it's about who the people are. You know, we had uh, we had subbies, but they. They weren't uh, representing the company the way I wanted them to, I would say. And and uh, we had some guys at some point, they were good installers, but they were trying to sell stuff to the customer on the side. And, and um, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm serious. So the, 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 their thing was um, surge protection for lightning. And so- um, What, which, a bit of, you get them on the job and then- And on, then they try the, and sell- On the, the yep, sly, they yes, do a bit of extra yes, selling yep, to the end customer. Yeah, and high pressure selling. We had customers calling us in tears- going, they're trying to make me buy surge protection and I don't want to buy surge protection and they're being really aggressive and what do I do? And, you know, like you guys didn't tell me about surge protection and we're like, we, we, we don't have anything to do with the surge that protection. That was the subcontractor. That was entirely the subbies that were trying to sell it on the side. And so, you know, we just went, nah, you know, like it's just, you know, their work was great and we were very happy with their quality, but, you know, you can't be upsetting customers and, and trying to <laughs> side deals, you know what I mean? And so, um, yeah, so uh, probably the last three or four years, we've just gone, no, nah, that's it. We're going to do it all in-house. And so our install team is on our staff. We've got an electrician and two apprentices. And, um, yeah, they'll be the ones that uh, come out with, you know, the company name. And, and, and I think it's good to um, – connect the retailer and the installer in one. You know, so often, especially with the cheap companies, they're completely different, you know. A, a retailer can be a, a, a call centre and a warehouse and that's it, you know, and have no kind of real presence. No, and they ring up two days before to find somebody to install yeah, it for the it. cheapest price. Yeah, and, and they've got the nerve to call us too. <laughs> um, yeah, we, we get those phone calls. Oh, we've got a solar system we need you to install and this sort of stuff. And, you know, the prices they – and not that we'd ever do that because – you know, we're taking responsibility for poor quality gear and, you know, effectively selling against ourselves. But um, some of the prices that they offer are just unbelievable. You know, like there's kind of like, oh, you know, can you go and put this system up and we'll give you $500. And I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> just like, you know, it doesn't come that's close to- That's my petrol. Yeah, that's it. It doesn't come close to covering uh, the costs, you know. Jesus. So, but yeah, um, yeah, they nah. got some nerve. Well, well, are you selling search protection now? No. Now that you're taking no. it in <laughs> No, that's it. No, because, and again, that's that's an experience there. I get the theory. It's a nice theory. However, having said that, uh, we've gone back to systems where people have bought the search protection, they've had a lightning strike, and it's blown up the equipment anyway. Mm. Yeah. So, <laughs> so no, no. it does seem like a bit of a snake oil Yeah, no, snake no. It's, oil it's kind just, of product. It, 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 it uh, breeds on fear. But doesn't deliver. Mm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How important is panel position? Do you just go and whack them any which way, or do you work out where you put them? Definitely not. You know, uh, north at about twenty-five degrees is ideally where you want them. Um, now, of course, it's not that simple because that may be the side of your house that's facing the street, and mm. you don't want to you don't want them to be seen. Um, you know, you may have an existing hot water system there, or you may not have any north roof, or there's all sorts of different considerations that uh, that change that. Um, but yeah, north on a 25 degree slope is our is the absolute ideal. If you can't do that, then try and balance them east and west, um, and that'll it won't give you as many kilowatt hours per day, but it'll be close. And if roof isn't an option at all, but you're out on the land, then ground mount is a really great option. Um, so it's a bit more expensive because there's a whole framing system that's got to be you know put into the ground, but that produces more power than anything else we've seen because the panels get some wind cooling and and uh, are in an absolute perfect position and are even adjustable if you want to adjust them throughout the year as the sun mm. changes angles. So, um, yeah, uh, panel positioning is important, but uh, if you can't get an ideal position, you can compensate with just more too. Mm. You know, if you, if you don't have an ideal roof, say you've got a roof that's completely flat, and you don't want to use lift legs to bring them up to the to the 25 degree angle, well, we can go, okay, that's all right. We'll put them dead flat, but we'll put up another 
of the panels and that'll, you know, that'll Make up achieve for the same goal yeah. for you. Oh, yeah. Okay. So if you'd be now with your 20 plus year experience, because you started at five years <laughs> helping it, yeah. your grandfather, if you would say what are the key uh, three or four things as key advice to get a good solar and battery outcome, what is that that you would give to an end customer? Um, probably uh, do your research on the company that you're buying it from. Make sure they're well established. Make sure they have been in the industry long enough to know what gear is good. You know, someone who's just started a year ago, they don't have the experience to know to know. Uh, you know what, what what's going to last and what what's lasts work, the what's test of not, time, yeah. yeah. Because the sales rep will come around and they'll all tell you that their their products will, you know, that's the best and it'll last forever and blah blah blah. blah. So um, yeah, uh, look at your installer is probably the the big one. Um, look at their other their previous installs. You know, a good quality install looks good. And so if you've got a mate that's bought a solar system off off this company you're looking at, go have a look. Go look mm -hmm. at the roof, look at the panels, have a chat to him, ask them how their experience was, um, you know, and so, uh, you know, because they've got, they, they, they don't have uh, any skin in the game and they're not going to, you know. <laughs> um, Lie to yeah, you. Yeah, that's it. They've got no incentive to. And so, uh, you know, if you've got a good friend that says, yep, I went with them and they were great, well, that's, you know, a really good endorsement. Um, yeah, product, you know, try and try and find good gear and I know it is tricky but staying with the the big names they're big names for a reason you know Ferronius, Enphase, Tesla, Selectronic you know that, that kind of uh, those big names are there and if you stick with them you'll be pretty safe as far as panels you know um, panels are a tricky one because it's nearly impossible to find one not made in China and so it's not a matter of find the non-Chinese panel. It's a matter of find the good Chinese panel. And they do exist. And um, we sell the Sumec uh, panel made by Phono. And um, they're made in China, but I would say they're definitely one of the best panels made in China. And, um, you know, we, we did a lot of research on them and um, looked into their company and, 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 and uh, looked into how they manufacture and their processing and stuff. And, and we've kind of uh, bet that, you know, they're, they're going to be there for a long time and, and there to back up their product. And so, you know, look into the company, look into the manufacturer um, and just uh, make sure that you're, you're comfortable with that, that, you know, they're, they're well established and that they've really got, really got some skin in the game. They're not just kind of dabbling in solar on the side um, you know so but having said that you know also diversity is good as in if, you, if you're buying solar panels off a company that only does solar then you've got to be thinking about well if they have a mass recall do they have the ability to stump up the cash for that mm. you know and whereas Sumec are into a whole bunch of other things and they're a multi-billion dollar company and so if a you know, if some big disaster recall happened, they can happily fund it. And so, you know, that, that gives you a lot of confidence. I I'm think, not sure if they're happily funded. Sure, yeah, happily is the wrong term, <laughs> yeah, but more than capable of funding it, you know, whereas if you are buying off a company that is solar only mm. and they have a third of their panels in recall, they're just going to go into administration and <laughs> you're not going to see yeah. any warranty out of yeah, that. Yeah, I would agree that the risk is probably higher, mm. yes. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I hear there's something called the workmanship warranty. Uh, what is it and how long do you offer? Yeah, so workmanship warranty is pretty well um, what we do. So the wiring, the, th the things that join your components together. Um, and so we've got a two-year workmanship warranty, um, which is, you know, that's what it is on paper. But having said that, if we've made a stuff up, it doesn't matter how long it takes for that to arise. We'll come and sort that out for you, you know. Mm. Um, but I think uh, any – the good thing about two years is that's long enough for – um, a stuff up to kind of rear its head, if that makes sense. Um, but again, that's very rare. And, um, you know, once uh, any established installer that's experienced, you know, it's it's very, very rare and unlikely that you make those mistakes that a workmanship warranty would need to be called on. But I hear some cheap companies give 15-year workmanship warranty. <laughs> but, well, yes, and again... Um, 
as we've talked about before, a warranty with a company that doesn't exist doesn't mean anything. And so, you know, like it's... Um, so what, I give you a 15-year warranty and I close the company in six months, That's is exactly it? right, you know, and, and, and <laughs> that's, not a, that's not a prediction. That's, that's, that's a proven fact. You know, as you said before, 800 solar installers have gone under in Australia, you know. Deliberately. In, deli- yeah, that's it. And so, and... Um, but, you know, but hang on, they're still in the industry because mm. Solar Shine closes... And Solar Shinier opens two days later. Yeah, with a different ABN and a different ACN and a, a brother as a director. Yeah, so it's um, you know, like it is technically called Phoenixing, I think, which is illegal. But you know, you got to kind of prove it, right? But um, you know, but you can't. The end consumer uh, shouldn't be expected to track down who the director of a company is and then find the new company that that director has opened or that that director's brother has opened or do you know what I mean? Like that's just not a, a, a reasonable expectation for a consumer. They should be able to buy a product and then go back to the company that sold it to them and be able to get that after service sale that they need. So without any hassle. What's your opinion on solar sales via door knocking and call centers and foot in the door hard sell methods? Yeah, not a fan. Um, I, I think... People shouldn't be pressured into this kind of decision. It's it's a it's a big decision. We're talking about thousands of dollars, and we're talking about permanent modifications to your home, and so um, it's not a new washing machine. And I think uh, people should be given time to make a considered uh, make a dis- considered decision. And uh, you know, cold calling and, and, and the door knocking and the high pressure stuff, you know, it just doesn't. And often we found people will just sign up to get rid of them. You know, like there's people, it's just they're so uncomfortable that they're like, okay, fine, whatever. I'll just sign up if you just leave me oh alone. Oh, my God. Yeah. That's the wrong choice. Definitely, yeah. And so, um, yeah, we don't we do not do any of that. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we very frequently get um, companies calling us up, offering us leads. So, so, you know, offering us people that are interested in solar. But we know that they get those leads from this cold, cold calling stuff. And we've just gone, no, nah, we're not interested because we don't want we don't want to start on the wrong foot with a customer. You know, someone that's disgruntled and, you know, reluctantly handed over their phone number to get rid of someone off the other end of the line. And then we come up and be like, oh, just chasing up your solar system. They're not, they're not in the right you know, right mood or the right state of mind to be mm. to be talking about that. And so, um, you know, uh, so much of our, our solar is we're letting people come to us on their terms in their time frame and then we work with that, you know. And, um, you know, we've got plenty of customers. Uh, we've got a, a guy at the moment that's uh, signed up and on the board, but um, – uh, he's uh, he's renovating his house or something and so, you know, not ready for six months. And so we're going, yep, no problem, just in your time. So he's signed up and essential energy applications and everything's ready to go. We're just waiting for, you know, his phone call to mm. um, to say he's ready and we'll go in and put the system in. So um, it's just, yeah, it's got to be done in the customer's time, not, not, a, not an instant sort of decision. Now, some people don't have the cash necessarily to stump up for a high quality solar system. What's your position on finance? Finance. Yeah, um, I think uh, borrowing the money. Well, again, I don't want to give financial advice because I'm not, I'm not, not sort of in that sphere. But um, we've seen customers have success uh, getting money from their own bank. So if you've got, you know, a mortgage or whatever, if you go and extend that, or however you want to do that, um, it seems to work out because a Good solar system can give you an up to 20% return on investment. And if you're borrowing your money at 6 or 8%, well, you know, there's a 12, 14%, you know, uh, profit mm. margin in that. And so I certainly think if you can get uh, good finance, then, then that's great. We don't offer any finance programs because uh, we looked into it and, again, plenty of companies have come to us and said, hey, you know, we'll finance all your jobs and you just send your customers our way and stuff. But, but you know, they're kind of a bit loan sharky and, um, you know, like asking really high interest rates and, and ridiculous sign-ups and things like that. So, um, yeah, but... Uh, you don't want to feed your customers towards those type of definitely operators. Definitely not. And so if you want to finance your system, then... Um, we recommend just go with who you currently have finance with, if Look, that's a the bank cheap, or whoever. The cheapest way is to draw back on your mortgage yes, because that's yeah. usually the cheapest uh, interest you can get. Mm. And uh, in that finance industry, have you heard about the uh, interest-free finance where 
they pack the interest right at the top and mm. put it on the system price first place yeah. and then claim there is no interest. So to anybody who's watching this, there is no such thing as no interest. Yeah. It's in your system price already built in and you've just been dudded. Is yeah, that your sure. experience? Yeah, for sure. You know, um, yeah, you never get something for nothing. And especially, you know, our current interest <laughs> rates, right? Like, they're, they're, no one's going to be lending you money at 0%. Are you kidding me? Because they could get way more than that, you know, somewhere else. Um, and so, yes, definitely. Uh, you don't get something for nothing. And uh, yeah, and your, your trusted lender is probably the best place to go. And financing, it definitely happens. We uh, had a customer recently that financed 15 kilowatts of Enphase and a Tesla Powerwall, all on finance. Mm. And, um, you know, and uh, I'm not quite sure how he obtained that, but that's, you know, that's up to him. And, uh, you know, it all went through and he's very happy, you know. So, well, he, yeah. if he gets his 20% return on the lower power bills, yeah. even that's on it. 6 or 7% interest, he no will brainer. still be ahead. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Now, um, the Prime Minister's recently announced that Australia is going to spend $1 billion on trying to start a local solar manufacturing industry. That's at the same time that Europe and the US actually closing factories because they can't compete with China. Um, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, it's uh, it's an interesting one. Um, I am all for Australian manufacturing, and you know uh, Australian made is good, and I think Slectronic have proved that over the last forty years or however long they've been in the industry mm, that mm. Australian manufacturing can be amazing. I think the problem with solar panels is they are so complicated and. Um, a solar panel manufacturing facility in Australia is only really an assembling assembly line. You know, they're still getting all their components from China. And my understanding is there's only two factories in the world that make the wafers that go into solar panels, and they're both in China. And so a... Um, Australian-made panel is really just an Australian-assembled panel out of Chinese components. And so... Um, it, it seems like a little bit of marketing spin, if I could put it that way, just to be able to put an Australian name on on something that kind of isn't at its at its core. Um, but it, it it depends what they do with it. Um, you know, it's one thing for government to announce something; it's another thing for you know that 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 facility to be up and running and producing solar panels. And look, if they produce them and they're great and they're high efficiency and they and they got good warranty and there's good companies behind it, then sure, great, go for it. Let's 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 get stuck into it. But um, I think um, it is fairly naive to think that we can just throw a few million or three hundred million at a at something and compete with the really big boys in the solar manufacturing that have been doing it for a long time. I mean, the number alone is is ridiculous because to do a polysilicon factory to then create the wafers, which is mm. the ground what you need to create the cell. That alone costs between three and four billion. That's it. Yeah. Um, and then, what about the over hundred thousand guys who work in research in China now? Mm. What about the fact that they are already making four, five, six hundred million panels, and and we would possibly try to create a hundred thousand panels? And I yeah. think there's a rule that every time you double production, you halve the costs. Mm. Uh, then we're physically quite away from a lot of the markets in Europe and the US. Um, whoever have been putting this together, uh, that money should have really, in my opinion, gone to the smaller manufacturers we have in Australia because we've got a lot of them with 20, 30, 50, 100 people who are doing specific specialised product and who are ready to grow. And I would have thought the existing heroes we already have, the cochleas, um, the canvas, you know, where we have actually created world-leading products, those ones should really deserve uh, the support to grow bigger rather than starting something in an industry where really the train has left the station. That's um, it, yeah. I had a discussion with my wife and I said, um, trying to now enter the solar industry when the rest of the world literally all closes it down because they can't compete. It's like trying to export iron ore and turn up with a kayak. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're so far behind, you know, so far behind, aren't we? You know, it's just to start off with that biggest a thirty year, you know, disadvantage or the you know thirty. Year head I mean, that's start. when we stopped make manufacturing in yeah. uh, in BP Solar in two thousand. Yep. 
um, why did we, if we would have continued, maybe we'd be sitting there and have a chance. Mm. But we're now 25 years ahead and trying to enter the race. That's it, yeah. Crazy. And look, yeah, and BP was great. They were our they were our first panels and, you know, we used to sell them and we used to love them and it was great. And I went through the factory in Homebush um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it was it was really cool to be out of, you know, see where they were made and things like that. But, oh, my goodness, like the pricing, as in we, we were talking about $1,600 for <laughs> an 80-watt panel versus now, you know, $300 for a 450-watt panel. And so, um, you know, it's uh, incredible how much the industry's changed in that time. And, uh, you know, I remember walking through that factory as a, as a kid and, um, you know, it was all done by hand. There was people everywhere. There was, it was kind of no mechanized process. It was, you know, people laying out the silicon cells. Soldering the together. Soldering yeah. them, yeah. <laughs> and you could tell because the cells weren't completely lined up. They weren't dead straight. They were in a bit of a wiggle because someone had, you know, sat them on the glass. So At one yeah. stage, they were producing two panels an hour. Yes. <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> That's the olden days. Mm. All right. Now, so what else would you like to share with your customers when they deal with New England Solar Power? What are they going to get? Are they getting you with a smile? Yes, definitely. Yeah. So, um, or probably some, you know, better looking people than me in our office. Um, I'm kind of the, I'm often behind the scenes, the problem solver. I'm kind of the guy when, when someone can't figure something out, they call me and I have to figure it out. That's kind of, a, kind of my role. I know so, your title, officer for special headaches. Yeah, that's it. Definitely. Um, so, so yeah. Um, but give me, give me a reason why people would pick your company. Uh, mixture, I would say, of experience, uh, longevity. Um, good quality products. Uh, we care. We're going to be there in a long time. And, uh, you know, our heart is in this industry. You know, there's so many um, electricians that kind of ta tag solar onto the end of their business name and do a little bit on the side because they think it's a get in, get rich kind of industry. We're not that. We're dedicated solar. We don't do house wiring and, uh, you know, um, just general electrical work. We are solar through and through. Um, you but know, what happens to those electrical when the solar boom goes down a bit? And that's it. That is, they scrub the solar off the end of their van and they go back to this, their, their solar stuff. And, you, know, and, and it's, you mean electrical stuff? Yeah, electrical stuff, yeah. And, and then that's like buying solar off a company that, um, you know, doesn't exist anymore because you call them up and say, there's a problem with my solar system. And they go, oh, sorry, we don't we do not do solar anymore. So you need to, you know, you need to call someone else. And so... New England. That's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we get the phone call. But, um, you know, solar's... Yeah, solar really is in in my blood and in our family's blood, and and, and we're gonna we're gonna really stick with it, and really, you know, it's a, it's a real passion of ours. Um, we're actually uh, in a partnership with uh, the University of New South Wales to uh, research the recycling of uh, solar panels and how we can do that in a really good way and a, a way that means that. Uh, a solar panel is is turned into um, exciting new components rather than just being dumped. You know, this all stemmed from um, a big hailstorm out in Narrabri probably about 10 years ago and, and it just went through and smashed nearly every single panel. And we went out there and did a heap of insurance work and we had all these broken panels and we took them to the Narrabri dump and they went, you can't dump solar panels here. And we went, oh, okay. <laughs> what on earth are we going to do with them then? And so... Um, you know, that sort of started us thinking, well, okay, there's got to be something we can do with these things. And so, um, yeah, we've, uh, yeah, kind of uh, been in contact with UNSW and, and, and built a, a good relationship with them and uh, the Smart Research Centre. And uh, it's now at a point where we're in, a, we're in an official partnership with them and, and working really hard together to um, disassemble a panel and turn it into completely new products that are, uh, you know, saleable and of you know have a have a market demand of their own, and so you know this is an incredibly exciting area, and I think it just shows that we care the we care so much that we're not just going to whack it up. We're going to whack it up and be there when it needs to be pulled down and have a solution for where those panels are going to go at their end of life. Because sadly, even the good stuff will fail one day. You know, a lot longer than the cheap stuff, but. Um, it will come a day where the, where the you know the LGs or the Sumex or the the your 
great panels need to come off a roof and have mm. to have something done with them. And, um, you know, we're going to be there with this solution where we can take those and fully recycle them into into a new product. So you've got the aluminium, which is in the frame, which is obviously mm. very straightforward. Yeah. You've got the copper in the buzz bars, which again is relatively yep. straightforward. You've got silver in solar panels too, I think yep. five, yeah, six bucks. about $6 bucks. with a yeah, silver, I think, yeah. in a panel. So, but then yeah. what do you do with the glass? So, um, <laughs> pushing my uh, <laughs> have you signed an NDA? Yeah, is so it you're pushing my non-disclosure uh, um, agreement um, here, Mark? Uh, uh, right, right, right. But, um, so you guys yeah. got a sexy opportunity for the glass, and it's not a yes. pink glass elephant. No, definitely not. No, no. There's some. Um, yeah, the, we have a process. So we've been able to fully disassemble a solar panel into its raw components, and that's something that us as New England Solar Power have done. We then give those raw components to UNSW, and they're currently in the process of researching how they turn those into new and valuable and specifically, you know, economically feasible products that can be sold into into other industries. And this isn't a high in the sky, we think we might be able to do this kind of thing. No, we have solid solid plans and there is research happening right now into how this is going to be done. And it's going to be a world first because anyone else that claims to recycle solar panels is taking the easy bits, the aluminium or whatever, and um, you the, know, rest the rest still goes in the, the landfill. Yeah. Whereas we will have a solar panel go in one end and outside of the other, there'll be no waste, but only five or six different products that will get sold on a market where there's a high demand for them. And so that's a really exciting, really exciting area. And it just kind of, you know, rounds off that uh, kind of the, uh, circle of, um, of solar. I, you know, in, in my mind, there's no point doing something that's good for the environment for the first 20 years and then it's bad for the environment for the rest of time because those panels are in a landfill somewhere. So you're taking responsibility. You're, you're actually a real solar nerd. Definitely, yeah. <laughs> and that's the thing. And it's not just our panels we'll recycle. We'll recycle the cheap ones and it doesn't mm, matter. You know, we'll mm. pull them all apart and, and make them into something new and exciting. I still want to know what you're building out of the glass. You'll maybe, have to wait. Maybe, maybe wait mar- find out. lots of marbles, is it? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, listen, it's been a great pleasure. I mean, you know, you, you are actually, you know, been with solar since you're five years old. You're still relatively young. Mm. You're now moving into the recycling arm. You're taking, you know, the whole thing very responsible. It's it's kind of solar all around your life. It's been really a pleasure to learn a lot new stuff today. Uh, Nick, uh, it's um, been great and you got to drive a few hours back from Sydney now. That's all right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Marcus. Cheers. Want more Energy Answered? Visit yourenergyanswers.com for quality energy products, tools and calculators and find your quality local installers. Please support the channel by liking the video, hit that subscribe button and ring the bell and check out all our other videos. You're still here? I'll see you next time. Bye.